coming to you with words and teaching that will change your life forever. All things that you will ever need in your life, they're wrapped up in the Word. Go for the Word. You need to understand this thing. And when you get a hold of it, keep saying it. Don't stop talking it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. The Bible says in the city of Ephesus, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Can you shout amen? I set the course that I must follow. In the name of Jesus, prosperity is mine. In the name of Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yay! Pastor Chris, word hearing. Praise the Lord. The different levels of relationships. See, when you're born again, you come into a new relationship with the living God. You come into a relationship with the living God. And this relationship is what God seeks to nurture so that you can become effective. Effective in His calling upon your life. Praise God. Several levels of relationships. Number one is your relationship with God. Number two, your relationship with Satan. Hello? Did you know there's a relationship with the devil? Very, very important for us to understand. Third is your relationship with man. The fourth one is your relationship with the world, your environment. The fifth one is your relationship with you. Hello? How do you see God? Who is he to you? How do you see the devil? Who is he to you? How do you see man? What's your relationship with him? How do you see the world, your environment, the world in which you live? What is it? What does God have to say about it? And how do you see you? How do you see you? Now you see, the information that we get here will affect the way we live the rest of our lives. The information that we get from the Word of God about these different relationships will affect the way we live the rest of our lives, whether we're going to be successful or we're not. What kind of people are we going to be? With God, first, you have to understand His reality. What does the Bible say about His reality? Is there a real God? In God's Word, what does He present to us? about his reality. He speaks very, very simply. You know, God appeals to the human spirit. You understand? He doesn't appeal to your mind. Romans chapter 1, he appeals to the human spirit. God appeals to the human spirit. He reaches the human spirit. You may not be able to discover God in the chemistry lab. But sure enough, you can get to know him through your spirit. Hallelujah. You can get to know him through your spirit. But then he tells us something about his reality. We cannot just look around and think that there is no God. Like people think that things just fell into place by themselves. No. Didn't it? You see, they talk about a big bang. I told you about that big bang. 
You know, they talk about a big bang and how there was such a great explosion. They can't describe the explosion, but there is evidence everywhere that there was such an explosion. Um, many, many, many years ago, they say millions of years ago, there was such an explosion and this whole thing came into being. Well, I do believe there was such an explosion because the Bible does tell us that there was such an explosion. But that explosion took place when God kicked the devil away from where he had put him. Did you hear me? That's what the Bible teaches us. In a moment, I'll show you that. Now, look at verse 20, chapter, in chapter 1, the book of Romans, verse 20. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Hallelujah. He says that people are without excuse because the invisible things of God that God has made can be understood by the things that are visible. You can get to understand that there must be a real God even though your optical eyes cannot see him. He says by looking at the things that you can see, you can tell there is a God somewhere. Hallelujah. See, the human spirit, the human spirit knows that there is a living God. The human spirit knows about that. Your brain may not be able to think it out, but your spirit knows. The human spirit craves a relationship with the living God. We can find that right from primitive man. Man knows there is a living God. Hallelujah. The next thing is to understand his power. In the Living Bible, as you read the 96th Psalm, in the Living Bible it tells us, His power can never be overthrown. Talking about the power of God. It can never be overthrown. Hallelujah. He talks about the glory and strength of Almighty God. His power can never be overthrown. His power is beyond description. Hallelujah. When you talk about the power of God, His power is beyond description. And when you read from the 4th verse down to the 8th verse of the 96th Psalm, he tells you that he, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. He says, the gods of the nations, the gods of the heathen are idols, but the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. So his eternal power is beyond description. And then, we talk about his presence, the presence of God. Where is God? People want to know where is the presence of God? Where can we feel the presence of God? Where is God? Is God in one point or is he in one place? Is he in one nation? Where is God? Psalm 139. Would you turn there very quickly? We said we're looking at things that you can understand, get to learn in five years. We want to get some of them in less than an hour. <laughs> Praise God. So you're going to have to do a lot of study for yourself by the time we're through. See, the scriptures that I give you, you go back and then look through your concordance and then um, get to have some more scriptures about the same things. But you just write the points down. Our relationship with God. Number one, His reality. Number two, His power. Number three, His presence. That's one message already. That's one sermon. I gave you, that, that's the second sermon. I gave you the first sermon. The first sermon was the five relationships that God brings us into. What are they like? Hallelujah. So, we now get the second message here. And that second one is, the, is what I just read to you. His reality, His power. Now we're talking about His presence. Where is God? Where is His presence? Where do we feel His presence? Okay, how can I... No matter where I am... How can I feel the presence of God? How do I contact God? Now David found out about that in uh, uh, Psalm 139 from verse number 7. He says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Where do I go from your spirit? If I want to run away from your spirit, where am I going to go? So he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I want to flee from your presence, where do I go? How can I hide from you? He says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. You're there in heaven, praise God. If I make my bed in Hades, behold, thou art there. Who? 
Actually, the, the Hebrew word used there is Sheol. Now, there's a difference between Sheol and uh, what you call hell. Praise God. But here, it's a general term that refers to the abode of the dead, where they go. So he says, if I make my bed in Sheol, which is a grave, he says, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the outermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Hey, come on here. God's in heaven, and we know that he has, he has raised the dead. How did he get him? Because God touched him, even from the grave. Hallelujah. So now he says, if I go to the uttermost part of the sea, you'll find me. We read about Jonah. And God got him out. Hallelujah. He says, verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. <laughs> Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. To God, both the darkness and the light are the same. Why? Because he is light. <laughs> Hallelujah. You cannot hide from God. Now, what, what David is telling us here is the presence of God is everywhere. Amen. Oh, his presence is everywhere. You know, we talk about the manifested presence of God and the presence of God. The presence of God is everywhere. You can really feel the presence of God everywhere. But the, manifest, the manifested presence of God is not everywhere. Now, the manifested presence of God means where God demonstrates His presence. Hallelujah. He may not demonstrate His presence everywhere. He may not show up His presence everywhere. But He's sure there. And you're going to find out when you dare believe Him anywhere. Hallelujah. Or where one makes a demand upon the power of God or the presence of God anywhere. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what do I find? I find a big thought here from getting to know about this from the word of God. I am the object of his love. How did I know? Because the power of God is love. And love is the greatest power in the world. And the Bible tells us about his nature, the nature of God. The nature of God is love. The Bible says God is love. So now I know there is a real God. See, I've come to Christ. I know He's alive. He's a real God. I find out, I discover His power is beyond description. He's got more power than any being. Hallelujah. Then I discover His presence is everywhere. And now I find out about His nature, that God is love. If, if he is love, there must be an object of his love. I find I am the object of his love. That's a third message that I discover. Now look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at it quick. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm reading to you verse 19. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? In other words, the great power of God is directed toward us who believe. All of his mighty power. I'm the object of his love. God demonstrates his power, but it's for my advantage, for my good. Hallelujah. The next time you hear thunder strike, the next time you see the lightnings of God, the next time you, you, you feel the power of God all around you, think about this thing. God is working on your behalf. Amen. The rains that come from heaven, they're not for your destruction. The sun that's shining, hallelujah. And all what we have in the firmament, they belong to God for my good. All of his power is directed toward me. I am the object of his love. Why does God demonstrate his power? Because of me. Because God loves me. Amen. When you start thinking that way, you never think like anyone can destroy you. No wonder God, Jesus tells us, never be afraid. All the time he tells us, never be afraid. Never be afraid. Because I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Because I'm the one. Don't be afraid. Because I'm here. Don't be afraid. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age, he says. 
Hallelujah. Getting to know this, this is a new relationship with the living God. He's more than a God up there who doesn't care about the world. He's more than a God up there who just wants religion, who just wants people to worship him and doesn't care about the good. No, God cares about me. I am the object of his love. And when you find out about that, you are more than a religious man. You have really come home. You have come to live victoriously. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the third message we've got now. Now let's go to the fourth one. Looking at Satan. What is our relationship with the devil? Who is he? We talk about number one, his nature. Number one is his nature. What does, what does the Bible tell us about his nature? Who is the devil? Who is he? Did God make a devil? How did he come about? Turn to the book of Isaiah. In uh, chapter number 14. Turn there real quick. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I am reading from verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That was his name. Come on. He says, how art thou fallen from heaven? So I know where he fell from. The Bible shows us he used to be in heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He was son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which this weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. Now God's showing us the heart of this, this being, Lucifer. What kind of a heart he has. It says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet shall thou be brought down to hell to the sides of the pits. The prophet speaks now. Speaks the voice of God to Lucifer. He says, yet you shall be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. He says, by the time men see you, they're going to say, who? Now he says, they shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That shook the nations? Are you in this place? They're going to look at him. And say, this one? You? People think he's so big. He's competing with God. No, he's not. Hallelujah. His glory is taken from him. He fell. He fell. He didn't retain his place. He doesn't have the glory. Ezekiel chapter 28. Turn to the book of Ezekiel quick. You gotta run, 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 you gotta run. Are you there? And I'm reading from verse number 12. Now here, I want you to understand this prophetic language as the prophet speaks and he, he, he comes out with a revelation. You gotta really study this and get to know who he's talking about. All right? Praise the Lord. He says, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyros. Now he says, the king of Tyros. Now if you, if you read it from the beginning, you find he talks about the prince of Tyros. And now he talks about the king of Tyros. And by the time he starts talking to us, we find he's actually dealing with a spirit being. Now the prince of Tyros is a man, but the king of Tyros is talking about is a spirit being. So we do understand from this that sometimes there are uh, in, in over certain, certain areas, certain cities or nations or towns or even villages, or certain environments, that uh, an evil spirit can rule over that area. Now, this king of Tyrus is a spirit being, and we're going to see what, who is he. Are you ready? All right. So, says, Son of man, in verse 12, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou stealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, he's talking to a spirit being. And the Lord says to him, You are the one. He says, Thou stealest up the sum. In other words, you were the seal of the perfection of beauty. 
With all the beautiful things that I made, you were the crown of it all. Now look at it. This is beautiful. Thou sealest of the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who? Oh, there's three of them we know about in Eden. Adam was there. Eve was there. And then there's the devil. The devil came in. And we know he's not talking about Adam here because Adam had died. He's not talking about Eve. Eve had died. There's one other, other such intelligent being that was found in, in, in the garden of Eden and that was Lucifer the devil. And he's the one that he's talking about here. Watch this. You see, a prophet is speaking in prophetic term, termolo, terminology. And it's very, very important that you get to know what he's talking about. Because when the prophet starts speaking, he speaks this way and this way. You understand? He speaks this way and this way. And you, because he's dealing with the people that are there right now. And his word goes beyond the nation that he's addressing. And he's talking for the now and talking for the future. And then he reveals the past. So when you listen to a prophet... It's important to understand what concerns you and who does anything here is concerned. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The only way to understand the message of a prophet is by the same spirit that brought the word through the prophet. So get this now. I read that again. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum of the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, that's verse thirteen, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the pars, and the diamond, the burial, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now, when it talks about pipes there in the 13th verse, a lot of part of it, that's why people say that he was leading the choir in heaven. Don't mind them. Look at verse 14. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub. Hmm, that's a spirit. That's an angelic being. So that couldn't be Adam. Couldn't be Eve. Couldn't be a man. He says, Thou art the anointed cherub that cover it. He was a covering cherub. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Boy, that being had been someplace. Hallelujah. I said, That devil had been someplace. Thou, look at verse 15, this is painful, this is touching. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. He was perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. How was iniquity found in him? We read in the book of Isaiah, the 14th chapter, where it says, Thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend to the Most High, I want to be like the Most High. I will go above the stars of God. Look at it now. Listen, look at, look at verse, verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will... What, what, what is happening here? He was God's vice regent. See, there were beings, there were angelic beings as well, and, and um, as well as physical beings in the earth, and, and Lucifer was seen to be in charge of all this. And before long, he began to take the worship. He was the one, you see, he was an anointed cherub, meaning that he had revelation. He was the one to reveal Almighty God to these beings over here. But now he wouldn't do that. And instead of getting them together, like every minister ought to do, he turned them to himself. Now look at this. By the multitude, verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast seen. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Do you know that's the same way he functions today? That's the same way he destroys people today? He tell people how powerful you are, how beautiful you are. How can you be serving God? You can be a real model. They'll pay you a lot of dollars for your looks, 
for your pointed nose long like a sword. <laughs> Pay a lot of dollars. What are you doing in church? Singing in the choir. What do you mean by amazing grace? How sweet the sound. When you could be singing somewhere. You got a good voice. Do you know that many of the singers in the world today start out, they started out in the church? But that's the same way the devil deceived them. He said, come on here. Hey, you can be doing that for free. You got a voice. You can market it. Hey, come on here. You got a look. You got good looks. Look at your legs. Look at you. Look at your eyes. Look at your hair. Boy, you could be a real model. Then you stand in front of the mirror. And by the time, and by the time, you're done thinking that way. You know what the Bible says about Judas? Judas loved money. Judas wanted to get money. Judas was ready to sell Jesus for money. And because he loved money and loved the praise of men more than the approval of God. He loved money. The Bible tells us how that one day Satan entered into him. He entered into him. How does the devil enter into people? Through thoughts. First, he will send his thoughts to you. And then you start thinking. And let me tell you something. The devil doesn't know everything in your mind. Make no mistakes about it. He doesn't have all the knowledge. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything going on in your mind. And he doesn't know what you're going to do. And he do he's not everywhere. How does he manifest himself everywhere? By his little demons. He has a good network. So they give him information. He's not everywhere. God asked him, where are you coming from? He said, from moving up and down all over the world. If he was everywhere, he wouldn't have to move up and down. And you remember Jesus when he was a baby. And uh, Satan didn't know where he was. He didn't know where he was. He knew that this was the time, according to the prophet, that a baby was supposed to be born. And he went out looking for Jesus to destroy him. And because he didn't know where he was, he moved upon a hero to kill every baby, every child from two years down. And by the time they were about to slay them, Jesus had been moved away from town. And the devil still didn't know it. <laughs> Hallelujah. He doesn't know everything. He's limited in his knowledge. He's a created being. Don't get this idea that he knows everything in your mind. Don't get the idea that he knows what's going to happen tomorrow when you're going to the office. He does not know. He may make a plan, but he's not sure it's going to come out right. So he's always spying and trying to listen in to us so that he'll know what to do. He only gets his information from us. He doesn't know everything. Hallelujah. That's so many times be careful about talking about your plans. Sometimes it's good to discuss them because he's not necessarily there. Don't think if I talk out, the devil will pick it and go do something. He doesn't have to be there. Sometimes when we talk, he's confused. He doesn't understand everything. Because when you start talking under the anointing, the devil is confused. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because he corrupted his anointing. And because of the corruption of his anointing, his anointing doesn't get the wisdom of God anymore. You see that? Do you understand it? So don't be afraid of the devil. He's already a mess. What a failure he is. Hallelujah. Wow. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. Can you see that? Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. So his wisdom doesn't function right. His wisdom always ends in failure. When he advises people, when he counsels people, they, they go into failure. He tells them how to do their business. He tells them how to run their thing. That's the reason the whole world is a mess. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world. He's the God of the system of this world. And because he's the God of the system of this world, the whole system is, an, is in a mess today. Hallelujah. Boy, the next thing we have to think about here. Oh, mm, no, let me finish reading this part. You'll like it. All right. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 18, it says, Thou hast defied thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Now God's talking about how he's going to destroy Lucifer. He says, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. God is wonderful. God's telling him, I'm going to blow you up from within you. 
He said, I'm going to blow you up from within you. I'll blow you up. <laughs> I'll put the explosive right inside you. <laughs> oh, so the devil is not going to say, well, I'm going to hide away from God. I'm going to run away. God says, I'll put the thing right inside you. It'll blow you up. <laughs> God is wonderful. Hallelujah. It shall devour thee. And I'll bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Hmm. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. Praise the Lord. Well, so we know his nature. We know his origin. We know why he became the devil. He was not created a devil. He was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. But now he's a devil. And we know something more. His defeat. He's running rampage all over the world right now. But we know about his defeat. Hallelujah. We've got this beautiful book, Join This Chariot. It's so important that you get your copy. This is a book for evangelism. It's a classic on soul winning. It'll make a soul winner out of you. It's titled, Join This Chariot. So you've got to get your copy today. The Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. Get wise and get on the bandwagon of soul winning. To place your order, please call the numbers not showing on your screen or online at www.christembassy.org Talk about his defeat for a moment. Would you look at Hebrews in chapter number 2? Book of Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm reading the 14th verse. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that he might, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That through death, see the plan of God was that through death he would destroy, paralyze him that had the power of death, that's the devil. Now in 1st John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might paralyze the works of the devil. Now has he done it? Yes! Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 8. He says, he led captivity captive. In other words, he led captives in his train. He's already defeated him. He's defeated the devil. So we know about his defeat. He led captives in his train. Now, you may not get that, but go to Colossians. Book of Colossians. Hallelujah. And I want to start reading here. Oh, this is beautiful. From verse 20. Okay, I'll read two portions to you. Colossians chapter 2. Let me read this one from verse 15. Uh, uh, I think it's nice. Let me read from from verse 9. It's so big. I don't know what it's that. Maybe the whole book. You've got to study the whole book yourself. For in him dwelleth all the... mm, talking about Jesus. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, all the totality of the being of God. If you want to find God in a body, you've got to look at Jesus. He says, in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then he says, and ye are perfected, complete in him, which is the head of all principality. Jesus is the head of all principality and power. He's the head above all spirit beings. Jesus is the head. Can you say amen? <laughs> He's the head of all principality and power. Jesus is the head. Amen. If you have been in the occult and they say, well, these devils are going to torment you. Jesus is the head. If you have been a Jiju worshiper, I'm telling you, and now you are delivered, you don't have to be afraid of them coming back to you because Jesus is the head. He's the head over all principality and power. They all recognize Jesus. Every one of them knows Jesus. 
They may try to lie to somebody and say, well, we don't know him. They all know Jesus. They know him. When he stepped into the synagogue in the old time, you remember in Bible days, he stepped into the synagogue, the demons cried out, we know who you are. The Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us before the time? They know he's the one to destroy them. Everywhere they cried, we know who you are. Because though he was in the body of a man, the Bible says though he found himself in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. But God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. Hallelujah. And that every tongue, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Every tongue. That devil may lie, but he's got to confess the Lordship of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, he's the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Brother, boy, this is better than the circumcision of Abraham. This one is made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Brothers and sisters, when you were, when you were baptized into Christ, you were buried with him. Hallelujah. He says, buried with him by baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who had raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your saints and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened that means made alive quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of <laughs> I love this oh hallelujah you know there's a law of Moses that speaks condemnation thou shalt not thou shalt thou shalt not all of the handwriting of ordinances he says that that handwriting of ordinances was against us because we couldn't obey it. So he saved us. He plucked us out. From the power of the law. And plucked us out. From the power of the devil. And then look at this. Blotting out. Look at it here. Blotting out the handwriting. Of ordinances. That was against us. Verse 14. Which was contrary to us. And took it out of the way. Nailing it to his cross. Hallelujah. Look at the 15 verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Having spoiled them. In other words. In defeating the devil. He took everything that was of value from Lucifer. And every demon of darkness. They don't have weapons to fight us anymore. Jesus took everything they could have fought us with. Having spoiled principalities and powers. He made... Oh, oh boy. Hallelujah. He made a show of them openly. That means public spectacle of them. He displayed his power. Hallelujah. And Abraham was watching in Hades. Isaac was looking at it. Jacob was there. Hallelujah. And all the patriarchs of old were looking at this. Abraham was there. Noah was there. They saw Jesus defeating the devil. He put his foot on his neck. He rendered him helpless. Hallelujah. Yeah. And David said, Jesus, go ahead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After Jesus had defeated the devil and all the cohorts of hell, he said, he came out and went to heaven. Who was he now? Who was he? I want to show you. I want to show you this victor. Let me show you this victor. Let me show you this victor. You want to know him? He said, lift up your heads, oh ye gates. He got to heaven. Michael was there. Michael didn't know him because the man was born again, being raised from the dead. He said, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Because Jesus was born again. Did you know Jesus was born again? Somebody said, well, he didn't need to be born again. I used to think that way. But he was born again. Because when he was on that cross, our sins were laid on his spirit. The Bible says he was made sin. Who knew no sin? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that was the reason when he became sin, the Bible tells us, the father turned his back on Jesus. And Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, Lamaxa, Why have you 
have you forsaken me? God turned away from Jesus. Because our sins were laid on his spirit. He died for us. He died to death. When the sins of man were laid on his spirit. He was separated from God and that's spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from God and that's the thing he dreaded. When he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. He never wanted to be separated from his father. But then he said, if it be thy will, I've got to go through it. And he did for us. Amen. And that's the reason Jesus could die physically. Because his spirit had been made sin for us. And when his spirit was made sin, death fastened on him. And then the Bible tells us he gave up the ghost. Jesus was dead. And then he was buried. And when he was buried in his spirit, he went to hell. When he got to hell, hallelujah, he fought that devil. The Bible says he threw your principalities. He threw your powers. And all of these, these saints of all that were in the other side of Hades, I told you about earlier. They were watching as Jesus made public spectacle of Satan and his cohorts of darkness. And when he had defeated them, the Bible tells us, he opened the cells of the ancient departed saints. And he brought Abraham out, Isaac, Jacob, David, all of them. And the prophets, he brought them out. When he brought them out, he sent them into the holy city. He wanted them to know the promise of Almighty God. When God said to Abraham, I'll give you this land to you and to your seed forever. And Abraham stepped on Jerusalem. Hallelujah. He had arrived. Isaac saw the beautiful land that God promised his father Abraham. Jacob saw his inheritance. And all of the kings and prophets of old. And God showed them my word came to pass. Now you can see your seed. Hallelujah. Turn to St. Matthew's Gospel. You see it there. St. Matthew's Gospel. Hallelujah. Chapter number 27. And I'm reading to you from verse 52. Maybe I should read from verse 50. Now Jesus is on the cross. He's dying. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, a veil of the temple was raining twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Did you see that? Jesus is wonderful. Watch this. You know, those, those men were buried. And their graves have been covered a long time. But when Jesus died on that cross, when he cried out into the hands, I commend my spirits. The veil in the temple was torn in twain from the top to the bottom. The Bible says the earth began to quake. And the rocks began to split. And when the rocks, the earth was quaking and the rocks were splitting, the graves were opened up. But the men were still dead. Because their spirits were held in bondage until Jesus went, went to hell when he died and set them free after his resurrection. Now their graves, their graves have been opened already three days earlier. So it was easy to come out. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. They were not ghosts. They came out in physical bodies. Otherwise they wouldn't need those graves to be opened. They came out. Look at this. What read in St. Matthew's Gospel, 27th chapter. <clears throat> Hallelujah. The 50th verse again. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, a veil of the temple was written in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks wrecked. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Hallelujah. They appeared unto many. They saw their seed. Hallelujah. Oh, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Well... In, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, where I read to you in the, in the 8th verse, he tells us he led captivity captive. He led captives in his train. He had two kinds of captives. The first set of captives were those whom he had delivered. The second set of captives were the devil 
and his angels. They, they were brought out, paralyzed. And Jesus took the ones he delivered to heaven. Praise the Lord. Satan has been paralyzed. Are you hearing me? The devil has been paralyzed. If he did appear to you tonight, you wouldn't have to run away. You wouldn't have to be afraid. You say, hey, paralyzed one, give him a nickname. Paralyzed one, what are you doing here? You're paralyzed. You know, I remember Richard Shambach, where somebody comes, Bob Shambach, Robert Shambach. Well, one time, you know, he was casting out a devil from a man. He said that was his first experience with a demon. And he said, you're coming out. That demon spoke out of that woman and said, I'm not coming out. He said, you are coming out in the name of Jesus. The demon spoke again and said, I'm not coming out. We have had this woman bound for so many years and we have made a home here. We are not moving. Then he said, the anointing came on him. As he spoke, because the devil said, we will wear you out. Because he kept saying, come out, come out. The devil said, we will wear you out. Then he said, we don't wear out, devil. When he said, we don't wear out, devil, the anointing just went through him. He said, my elder brother Jesus defeated you in Calvary. He put his foot on your neck. He has defeated you. The devil said, no, shut up, don't say it. He said, I said it again. I said, my brother defeated you. Jesus defeated you. He said, I said, don't say it. Then he said it again. And the devil said, all right, I know I'm defeated, but please don't tell everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, when I heard that, I made up my mind. I'm going to tell the whole world, Jesus defeated the devil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, I know I'm defeated, but please don't tell everybody. Don't tell everybody, but I'm going to tell everybody. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Psalm 24. Are you still here? From verse 7, when Jesus went with his, with his, uh, with the people he had delivered, with his saved ones, moving them from Abraham's bosom and going to heaven. Now they got to the gates. Jesus was born again. He was a new creation. Look, when you're born again in the spirit, you're not the same. Your body may look the same, but you're not the same. And then they said, look at this. He got there, he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Remember, he has just come from the battle. He has just come from winning. He has just come, hallelujah, from defeating the devil. Who is the king of glory was the voice. Who is this king of glory? And the Lord answered back, the Lord strong and mighty. Hey, hey hallelujah. The Lord mighty in battle. And he cried out again, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. These are the doors of heaven. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Hallelujah. Jesus is the king of glory. Mighty in battle. Mighty in battle. The devil has been defeated. Where is his domain? Where does he function? Jesus called him the prince of this world. He functions in this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world. That's the third point. We're talking about number one, his nature. Number two, his defeat. And number three, his domain. Where, even though he's defeated, where does he function? Why do we still feel his impact? Because he's in this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Paul called him the god of this world. He's a god of this world system. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. He's a God of this world system. Hallelujah. Jesus said, he's the prince of this world and he has nothing in me. That's in St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 30. He's the prince of this world. 
but he doesn't have anything in me. Isn't that beautiful? Hallelujah. So what? What do I get? As my, as my own message there, I am his victor. I am the devil's victor. See, because Jesus defeated the devil and gave me the victory. The Bible says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. He has made me the devil's victor. Because in St. Luke's gospel chapter number 10 and verse 19, he tells us, I'll be here sitting far from heaven as lightning. He says, behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all the power, the ability, over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I've given you power. Maybe your child is convulsing. Don't run around. He's given you power. Grab that child and say, devil, come out of my baby. If your, if your husband has been attacked and he's feeling like his heart is going, it's getting abnormal. He's shaking there, shaking. He's like he's dying. Don't start crying. Oh, my husband. No, go to him. Get your hands on him and say, devil, come out in Jesus' name. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Use the power that God has given to you by Jesus Christ. So the devil is functioning in this earth realm. So we know. He's functioning around us, but we are not afraid of him. Amen. Amen. We are not. A, say, I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of him. Hear me, brothers and sisters. I cast out devils. I know they are afraid of Jesus. Sometimes they say, "Don't say anything. I'll go out." Yeah. Lots of times because that name torments them. It sets a fire inside them. When you start calling the name of Jesus under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the demons scream because it sets a fire inside them. Hallelujah. Glory. Don't be afraid of anything. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, how much more can I take? How much more can I take? Relationship with man. Your relationship with man, man's origin. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, you remember God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Man came from God. God made him. He didn't just drop from the sky. God made him. Look at his origin. Understand his origin. Now you're with Christ. Now you're born again. You're a child of God. Understand what God says about man. Man didn't just find himself here. The Bible says that there came a day when God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So understand his origin. Understand how he became what he is. He fell by the deceit of Satan. That's the way he fell. Understand his salvation. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, turn there quickly so you can see it for yourself. See, these are the things that make us preach what we preach. Are you getting it? Are you still here? 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Talking about his salvation. He came into the world to save sinners. Hallelujah. Romans 1, 16. Romans chapter 1, in verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The salvation of man is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? That's his salvation. Number three is his destiny. Man's destiny. This is touching. We're talking about our relationship with man. Now when, you, when you're born again, you look at other people and you understand that number one, they came from God. God made them. Number two is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save them. 
He came into the world to save sinners. That's what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. And number three, you understand that that's the gospel that saves them. You understand? That's the gospel that, that reaches them. So here you are. You know his origin. You know God's plan for his salvation. It has worked for you. Now you're saved. You have to understand the, the, the destiny of man. Daniel chapter 12. The book, the book of Daniel, chapter number 12. The destiny of man. This one should make you shake. It should make you tremble. It should make you think. It should make you decide on something. When God saves you, He makes you His partner. And He lets you know man's origin. He lets you know God's plan of salvation. And He lets you know man's destiny. Look at it here. From verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up. That's Daniel chapter 12. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth. Those who, he's talking about dead people. He says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Hallelujah. This is man's destiny. Will you be among those that will turn many to righteousness? Will you be among the wise? It says, they that be wise shall shine as the stars. Who are the wise? The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. If you're a soul winner, the Bible says you are wise. And the wise will walk with God. Hallelujah. But it says, the other ones, the sinners, they will be awakened to shame and everlasting contempt. Where do you stand? What are you going to do? Because of this, I find I am his neighbor. You see, number one, with God, I am the object of his love. Number two, with Satan, I am his victor. Number three, with man, I am his neighbor. Are you hearing me today? Yes. If you know man's origin that he came from God. And you know that God has saved him by Jesus Christ. And you know his destiny. It's only through the gospel that he will be saved. Otherwise he will go into everlasting shame and contempt. What are you going to do? I find by the gospel I am his neighbor. I am his neighbor. So I can reach out to touch him. You become a soul winner when Christ saves you. One thing he wants you to do is to win souls. To bring people out of darkness. Turn them to Christ. Are you man's neighbor? Are you his neighbor? Think about it today.